So um, now we're going to hear from three different people who are in, um, have been working as community members to uh, how, how they would like to see this waste dealt with. So the first of our community members is uh, Don Hancock. He's the director of the Nuclear Waste Program at the nonprofit Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He has worked on nuclear waste issues, including the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant since 1975, and nationally he works on nuclear waste issues at Department of Energy facilities and high-level waste storage and disposal sites. He has published articles, testified at numerous state, federal, and congressional hearings, and has been a consultant to citizen groups, states, and Indian tribes. Go ahead, please, Mr. Hancock. Thank you very much, Cheryl, and um, the APS for this invitation and the opportunity. Are you able to hear me and see my slides? Yes. Great, thank you. So uh, as was mentioned, um, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant is currently the world's only operating deep geologic repository. It is for transuranic or plutonium contaminated waste. So I'm gonna be covered, oops, there we go, sorry. I'm gonna be covering uh, briefly the 50 year history of agreements and laws regarding WIP, the performance since the facility opened in 1999, recent Department of Energy effort to expand WIP, um, both physical facility and changing requirements. And related to that, those changing requirements issued and raised by the National Academies of Sciences in a 2020 report related to surplus plutonium and WIP. So why was WIP created? You've kind of heard a little bit about that, uh, except that the plutonium pits, the plutonium from Hanford uh, and Savannah River that were put in pit form, the cores of more than 50,000 nuclear weapons were manufactured at the Rocky Flats plant near Denver, Colorado from 1952 to 1989. The plutonium contaminated transuranic waste was shipped to the Idaho National Lab from 1954 to 1970. And this is, this is the before picture from Nicole's presentation of uh, how the waste was years later when it was being dug up. Dug up. Uh, by 1970, Idaho was saying, wait a minute, we're not gonna take all of this waste forever. Um, so the Atomic Energy Commission, which was also mentioned in Tom's slide, um, at the time, the federal agency promised, to, began two things. Uh, a promise to ship the waste out of Idaho starting in 1980 and to from there and on, store the waste on the surface rather than dumping it so it would be easier to remove. At the time, the AEC was working on developing a geologic repository and following year in 71, they selected a salt uh, mine near Lyons, Kansas and said that the, that repository would begin open, op operating in 1975. The next year that site was abandoned for technical uh, and public acceptability reasons. A few people in Carlsbad, New Mexico, public officials invited AEC to come and do the first repository uh, in New Mexico, and that was the start of WIP. By 1979, responding to what DOE was doing and citizen concerns, the New Mexico legislature passed a law to prohibiting waste storage uh, and disposal until the state had concurred. Uh, Congress didn't necessarily like concurrence, and so when WIP was first authorized in 1979, the law um, provided for a consultation and cooperation agreement between DOE and the state. Um, that law also said WIP would not be subject to nuclear regulatory commissioning licensing like uh, many nuclear facilities are. President Carter disagreed with that and tried to cancel WIP. Um, but when President Reagan came in in 1981, uh, he decided and his DOE decided to proceed with WIP. Uh, the state of New Mexico sued and one result of that litigation was the consultation and cooperation uh, agreement. And then the second WIP authorization law was 1992 
The Land Withdrawal Act, it explicitly bans spent fuel and high level waste and provides some limits for WIP. So that therefore defines the WIP mission to start clean and stay clean to dispose of up to 175,000 cubic meters of defense transuranic waste. Uh, about 60% of that uh, as of last Saturday was at WIP. Uh, WIP uh, has surface facilities that you can see here where the waste comes in. There are four shafts that, sorry, there are four shafts that uh, take it to the underground and then there are eight panels of seven rooms a piece in the underground. So to get the waste to WIP obviously requires getting the waste there. So it's trucked through more than 20 states from uh, more than a dozen DOE sites uh, to Southeastern New Mexico uh, for third part of the mission is therefore to remove transuranic waste from those DOE sites so that they are less contaminated and less dangerous. And then fourthly to safely close, decontaminate and decommission the WIP site um, beginning in, 19, in 2024, according to the WIP permit, uh, as we'll be discussing more, the Department of Energy no longer wants to uh, abide by that time frame. But regardless, other repositories are necessary for legal and technical reasons. We've talked about the LIP, WIP laws and its requirements, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, which deals with commercial uh, waste from nuclear power plants, says there need to be other geologic repositories uh, we as a nation are continuing to generate more waste from uh, the nuclear weapons activities and the cleanup activities. There is no policy to stop weapons production. And of course, nuclear power continues to uh, generate uh, waste uh, as well. There are, can be technical problems at any one site. So the, all, the idea has always been to have multiple sites uh, in case there are problems at, uh, that develop at, at sites. Uh, one failure site would not work well to handle all the waste. And of course, uh, no state, uh, including New Mexico, just like Idaho said, we didn't want it. And Colorado said they didn't want it. Nevada said they didn't want to be the only site. New Mexico is not willing to be the only repository site. So importantly, in terms of WIP site, so this in the center is where it says WIP site boundary is the 16 square miles of the WIP site. Uh, this is in the Permian Basin, salt in the Permian Basin, uh, which at the time the site was selected was, uh, there was not active oil and gas production around the site. Uh, and the 16 square mile site is set aside for DOE and, and oil and gas is prohibited there. But you can see all around the site, um, there are now active operating oil and gas uh, wells, um, almost 200 within a mile of the site boundary, as you can see some of them right actually on the site boundary, uh, approaching 600 wells within two and a half miles of the site. Um, so uh, the idea of expanding this facility um, seems uh, not like a good idea from a technical standpoint, given all the drilling, including in some cases, hydro hydrologic fracking that's now starting. So let's move on to WIPS performance. Uh, the first shipment came in March 26th of 1999. Uh, from the beginning, there have been performance issues with not using all of the space at WIP for a variety of reasons. Some relate to um, the ground control um, movement of salt uh, that creates problems. But you can also see the peak year of operation of WIP in fiscal year 2006, more than 10,000 cubic meters of waste was disposed of WIP. At that rate, um, that legal capacity would be reached uh, within 17 years. Um, this is a very busy slide that I won't go through other than to point out uh, some of the things in red. By, by uh, early 2014, the first six of the eight panels uh, were used and closed, but they only about 81% of the space was used. So uh, in terms of that legal capacity that it was designed for, those first six panels were um, almost 21,000 cubic meters uh, short of the capacity. So the full eight panels that were designed to hold all of the 175,000 
um, cubic meters of waste will not be able to hold it all because of how the facility has been operated. So why is that the case? Um, well, um, DOE didn't issue it, has not uh, issued any public analysis to explain the performance problems. Congress has continued to fund and in some cases increased the funding for WIP, but haven't provided public analysis. Um, the government agency that does uh, review DOE and other facilities, the Government Accountability Office or GAO, finds that WIP and many of the DOE sites uh, have major problems for inadequate oversight of contract management. It's important for people to understand that 90 to 90 percent of the 90 to 95 percent of the workforce at DOE facilities are contractors, not federal employees. So this the, the contractors are operating these facilities and DOE uh, have inadequately manages those. The 2012 WIP contract uh, for the, um, what was then a new contractor and is still the contractor, specified to try to make clear what the performance requirements were, that it was to receive dis waste up to complete up to 90% of the legacy transuranic waste by the end of fiscal 2015, September 30th of 2015. So the four year goal was 39,712 cubic meters. What was actually done in those four years was less than a third of that much. Then things changed uh, further in terms of performance of the facility on February 5th, 2014. Uh, the vehicle, as you see in the, in the uh, upper left, a salt hauling truck caught on fire, um, smoke went through the underground and up to the surface. This is the uh, salt shaft, one of the four shafts. You can see uh, smoke coming out uh, from this fire. All of the workers underground had to be evacuated. 13 were treated for smoke inhalation. At least one worker was permanently disabled. Uh, the waste hoist um, took 11 months to clean up uh, to get back into operation. Uh, and the analysis that was done of this particular event was that there was a pervasive lack of adequate maintenance. Workers were not adequately trained. There was an adequate emergency response. Um, mine safety practices were not adequate. Um, so the whole laundry list of major problems was operating the facility. Nine days later, a second event occurred, a radiation release. Um, uh, uh, amounts of radioactivity were released from the underground. The radiation detected and monitors in the underground went off. Um, uh, there were, of course, no workers underground because of the fire. Um, uh, there were 13 workers on the surface of the site. DOE said for the first two days after the event that there was no contamination of personnel or equipment uh, at all. In reality, the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, the independent radiation monitoring agency, did detect a radiation release, and they first informed uh, workers and the public that a radiation release um, from the underground had occurred. <clears throat> it turned out that all the 13 workers that were on the surface at the time of the release were internally contaminated. Nine other workers that came the following day on February 15th, uh, because DOE said there wasn't contamination on the surface, also ended up being uh, contaminated internally. Um, it took weeks for them to be notified of that. Uh, none of these workers were provided any special medical treatment, no screening of their vehicles, homes, or families. DOE's rationale for that was they presumed that each of these people got less than a 10 millirem internal dose. Um, the underground was, in fact, of course, severely contaminated. Um, more than 8,000 linear feet of the underground was and still is contaminated. This is a, a slide from two years, the contamination levels in 2016, two years after the radiation release. Um, <clears throat> so the underground panel seven, where the, um, uh, where the ex explosion, the drum occurred, um, uh, and the areas up to and including the exhaust shaft. So the ventilation air, of course, carried um, the radioactivity uh, in the underground and up the shaft uh, 2,150 feet to the surface. DOE did an extensive uh, year-long accident investigation of this that 
found that this accident should not have happened. It was preventable. Uh, and there were failures at DOE headquarters, at WIP, at Los Alamos, which was the source of the containers that exploded. Um, lack of contractor training, characterization of the waste, problems with the safety culture, and uh, 40 judgments of need in terms of specific improvements that were needed. At the same time, DOE WIP produced its recovery plan, what it was gonna take to get back into operation from this radiation release. The estimated cost was $240 million over two years to get disposal operations back in operation by March of 2016. Um, Two new things would be required, a new ventilation system because the underground was contaminated and therefore the air uh, was not clean anymore, um, and a new exhaust shaft to replace the contaminated exhaust shaft um, uh, were what the plan said. Uh, so we're now uh, eight years out from these incidents the new ventilation system um, is still under construction. Um, the current cost is now estimated at $486 million, 70% more than the high estimate uh, that you saw originally in the earlier slide. And rather than being uh, operating soon after 2016, it's now scheduled perhaps for 2026. The new shaft, which is no longer an exhaust shaft, they've decided to continue using the contaminated exhaust shaft, but the new shaft, uh, which is for ex physically expanding the facility, uh, the latest cost estimate was $197 million. That's four times the original estimate, um, but that number is now acknowledged to be too low and they're coming up with a new estimate. And as I said, they're continuing to use the exhaust um, existing shaft, exhaust shaft and have started operating one of the fans that uh, is, uh, does not vent or does not go through a HEPA filter system. So uh, that air, contaminated air from the underground with small amounts of radioactivity is now pretty constantly put into the air. Um, so the, the numbers are from a report released this week by the Government Accountability Office. The, another agency that monitors both uh, WIP and Hanford and other Department of Energy facilities is the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board. Uh, it's not a regulator, it's a technical group that looks at what's going on. And I won't spend a lot of time going through this, but this is just from their January, one month, January 2022 report of continuing problems with the 700C fan, um, personnel not being adequately trained. Remember that was one of the problems eight years ago. Um, shipping can, empty shipping containers not being correctly put back together at WIP uh, and maintenance supervisors not properly using following procedures with the changing fuses in the air intake shaft hoist. So, Despite all of this, uh, DOE uh, wants to expand WIP and uh, extend its lifetime. Uh, three major drivers for that, there's continuing waste generation by NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Administration of DOE, the weapons part of DOE. There's surplus plutonium. Uh, this is plutonium uh, uh, produced at Hanford and Savannah River, and in some cases at uh, put in, or in most cases, put into nuclear weapons. As we've reduced our number of nuclear weapons in conjunction with the, the Russians, we now have surplus plutonium, perhaps up to 48 metric tons of it. Um, so it would be changed into a form that it could be disposed at WIP. And then thirdly, um, the government's policy is to uh, dramatically increase the amount of plutonium pits we have for new nuclear bombs. Uh, that, of course, will create more waste uh, itself. So for all of these things, when there is only one geologic repository, the only place they can go is either stay at the facilities um, uh, or, or go to the only repository, which is WIP. So expansion, uh, and DOE doesn't even like to use the term, uh, expansion um, comes in both expanding that design of the four shafts and eight panels and expanding the capacity beyond that legal limit uh, in the 
state agreement and the law uh, in terms of the 175,000 cubic meters. Uh, starting as early as 2013, there was discussion of additional panels, panels 9A and 10A, as they were called. Um, we've already talked about the new ventilation system and shaft. In 2018, uh, DOE decided that they needed to change how the waste was calculated. So there are now two ways of calculating the waste, the way it always was, including in the contract that I mentioned, et cetera, and a separate way that they call the volume of record, which is approximately 30% less, less waste than uh, uh, lets them bring in using those calculations 30% more than the legal capacity. Uh, and now in 2021, they've formally proposed two new panels uh, to the west uh, of the uh, existing uh, panels along with that new shaft, which is helped, would help to serve them. They, DOE describes in some documents um, the expansion, but in other places they deny it. So in 2016, the contractor, operating contractor, got a $250,000 bonus to put together the first iteration of operating the facility through 2050. Uh, that was released only to the public only after a Freedom of Information Act by my organization. The next year, DOE did publish a WIP strategic uh, plan that talked about WIP uh, staying open till 2050. Uh, in 2019, the final environmental impact statement for this new pit production that I talked about said WIP would need to operate until 2080 to handle all of that um, additional waste from pit production. Um, and then uh, this March 31st of 2020, in a, their permit renewal application to renew the permit, uh, state permit for WIP, uh, they proposed eliminating the 2024 date to have no end date for WIP, um, so it could operate essentially forever until DOE decided they didn't want to. Uh, on the other hand, they've denied it um, to the New Mexico Supreme Court in a filing in 2020. They said authorization for an expansion is not yet even before the NMED, that's the New Mexico Environment Department let alone the New Mexico Supreme Court. And so it isn't something that they would talk about or say anybody else should be talking about. Uh, and then last year in the permitting process for the new shaft, they said, quote, planned expansion in reality is not a plan, but a future possibility. And again, people shouldn't talk about it or be concerned about it. But people are concerned about it. Uh, separately, the Government Accountability Office in a report issued last year about WIP uh, said uh, in terms of DOE internal documents that GAO reviewed, there are plans to more than double the size of WIP rather than the eight panels to have nine panels, at least nine panels in the future um, to uh, the west of, of the existing facility. Uh, and then the National Academy of Sciences was asked by Congress to, to look at the surplus plutonium, that second uh, driver that I mentioned both how it would operate technically, what sites would be involved, and how it would relate to WIP. And their report, um, after more than two years of study, released in April of 2020, said that no, it, all this waste doesn't fit into WIP. Um, by the historic way of calculating, they're proposing more than 150% of the capacity. And even with the new way, way to calculate, um, to put more in, they would still significantly uh, exceed the legal limit for WIP. The NAS report also had numerous um, uh, recommendations, um, a comprehensive programmatic environmental impact statement so everybody would understand what's being proposed, a robust uh, stakeholder and transparency engagement, and a specific finding that the DOE's segmented incremental approach that they were using obfuscates uh, what they're trying to do and its consequences. So just as a reminder, we have since 1981, we have written agreements with the state and DOE that require state and public comment before these expansion plans that hasn't happened. The Land Withdrawal Act limits it, says that EPA will certify the site, uh, the state will have permitting authority the 1998 EPA certification 
included none of the surplus plutonium and none in the repository of its original eight panels, nothing larger than that. The WIP permit uh, includes those kinds of limits and also said disposal uh, should end starting in 2024. So quickly some conclusions. WIP is the world's only operating geologic repository. It demonstrates that there are difficulties to develop and operate uh, such a facility. There are technical problems, there are legal issues, public acceptability issues. To get WIP open required the laws, the CNC agreements and the permit. So DOE's current and future non-adherence to those requirements heightens public controversy that is happening in New Mexico. It also undermines uh, confidence in other repositories. If DOE is not gonna agree with the legal and regulatory requirements they have, why would any other state, any other place say they would trust DOE? Uh, but finally, the federal government must develop uh, and should have already, but must develop now a program for new repositories for transuranic waste that doesn't all fit at WIP, uh, not to mention spe spent fuel and high level waste facilities. Um, just quickly, here are uh, some websites that you can get more information. The DOE WIP website, the Mexico Environmental Department WIP website, uh, linked to the National Academy of Sciences report that I mentioned, linked to the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, which puts out regular reports, weekly reports about Hanford, um, as well as um, uh, WIP and other facilities and my organization's website. And there's my contact information and I will stop. So there's at least hopefully a little time for questions. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, we have eight minutes in which we, uh, people in the room can ask some questions and people online. I, I'm just gonna take a quick look at my screen over here. So please uh, be thinking about this um, I suspect many of you didn't realize just how awful the situation was with trying to deal with this enormous amounts of radioactive waste. Please come to the uh, uh, mic. Thank you. Uh, contamination of uh, the surface of the earth, of the surface and water by nuclear waste is really terrible, but we should realize that the problem with nuclear waste exists not only on the Earth, but also in space. During the history of mankind, more than one nation was launching satellites powered by nuclear reactors because deorbiting nuclear reactors was not safe. Uh, those satellites were uh, put into orbit where they are supposed to orbit for at least several thousand years. And these dead satellites with nuclear reactors are still there. <laughs> uh, uh, when uh, this process was designed, nobody was thinking about an increasing amount of uh, space junk. <laughs> if uh, uh, satellites with dead nuclear reactors just orbiting the Earth and don't collide with anything, that is safe, that's okay. However, uh, more and more satellites are being launched into space. The amount of space junk orbiting the Earth is increasing. And collisions of space junk with nuclear reactors will happen. In the result of those collisions, pieces of nuclear reactors will become radioactive space junk. Some of it will fall on the Earth. So what do you think about nuclear reactors or, or their pieces uh, falling on your head, or maybe on my head, and how we are going to prevent that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I don't know if you feel qualified to answer that, Dan? Uh, no, that's not something that I'm uh, prepared to deal with. I'm trying to deal with the uh, waste that we have uh, uh, in the United States and in New Mexico. Uh, and of course, the gentleman is right. Insofar as there's radioactivity coming from space, that would add to the problem. Um, question, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for the really informative talk. Um, I was wondering, what are the monitoring steps that are sort of built into WIP to let us know if the facility is doing an appropriate job containing the waste that's already there, and like what potential uh, plans are there for remediation if there is like a contamination event that leaves the facility? So there are several kinds of monitoring. The state's permit that I mentioned, the Environmental Protection Agency, and then the actual main on-site independent monitoring is the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center, which is an independent organization funded by DOE to um, try to measure any contamination that did happen. And as I mentioned, it did work in 2014 when contamination was released. The plan always was for WIP to need to be decontaminated. It was never supposed to be contaminated as it was in 2014. Um, but the idea is the all of those, the, the salt will move over time to close up the underground area. The shafts would be closed up. Uh, the surface buildings would all be taken down that over a 10 year or so period after the facility uh, stops receiving waste. So there has always been a 10 year or so period built in uh, to close the facility up. But the idea was, of course, there wouldn't be any contamination on the surface. Um, there is some, and as I mentioned, with how they're now saying they wanna operate the facility, there is small. there are small amounts of radioactivity that are pretty continuously uh, released. The Department of Energy's view is that those levels of contamination don't require uh, remediation on the surface. Um, so they uh, currently don't plan to do any of those kinds of things. Um, so that's, you know, kind of, kind of briefly, um, uh, there is public, the, the reason there is the CMERC, the independent monitoring and the EPA and uh, state permitting was because of citizen and technical concerns that there needed to be adequate uh, monitoring of what was going on. Um, because while the hope was that all the radioactivity would be contained in the underground, and then when the facility was sealed up, it would stay there. Um, the standards for WIP are that the radiation is supposed to be contained uh, fairly well for 10,000 years. So that's the idea of geologic repositories, that they shouldn't over time need too much monitoring because the natural geology and what are called engineered barriers, the, the, the containers that the waste is put in, in some cases, would prevent release. Um, as I mentioned in one of my conclusions, WIP has shown this is a more difficult technical problem than maybe what was thought about for a long time, which is, again, one of the reasons WIP's the only um, repository so far operating in the world. Um, Finland and Sweden are trying to get deep geologic repositories operating in the next few years. So thank you. As Cheryl said, the whole thing seems much worse than I ever would have imagined. Do you think that the problems are more people-driven, that people aren't doing what they should do, monitoring, acknowledging problems, or that more problems are technical? If everybody behaved well, how big of a problem would there have been or would there be? Uh, it's both, and as I, I tried to emphasize that. So it wasn't that people were not paying attention when the facility was cited. Um, you know, it was thought at the time there, it was in the Permian Basin, it was salt, and there wasn't oil and gas production going on right in the immediate area. And so the idea of drilling in the site or um, uh, faults coming from fracking or other things that was thought that wouldn't happen. Uh, that was in the 1970s. Well, things have changed in the last 45 years. And as I showed in the slide, there, there are um, severe problems. Um, the thought was that they knew salt would move, um, but it, it moves differentially and in ways that they weren't expecting. So 
Part of the reason some of the underground space hasn't been able to be used is because of ceiling collapses um, that were happening before they could be remedied and, and, and stopped. Uh, and so that's a technical problem with the site as well. The oil and gas wells are a technical problem um, that are, those are difficult things to resolve. Of course, there are lots of people problems. Um, one of the things, um, as I've said, it's dependent on contractors and not just at WIP, but at many DOE facilities, there are contract management, uh, budget scheduling kinds of, of, of problems which allows me to give an answer to one of the questions from Nicole's speech. The question was, what are the total estimated costs? Um, Tom in the last session mentioned the Hanford cost. Uh, in their report to Congress last year, the Department of Energy said the, the total life cycle cost for all of these sites that um, Nicole mentioned would be between $639 million billion and 867 billion dollars. So that's a pretty wide range, but given what I pointed out about WIP, uh, costs are typically higher than even sometimes DOE's highest costs are. Um, so that's a problem. So it's both. Um, and then as I say, importantly for people who like my organization that think geologic disposal is the way to go for dangerous wastes that are dangerous for thousands of generations in the future, um, the fact that DOE is unwilling to comply with laws and agreements um, is a, a, a further that gives gives lie to the idea that any any place else would say, okay, we know what's going to happen, we can consent to it because they're, it's going to operate the way we're told. There will be checks and balances. It will close up. It will have some limits that will be abided by. Um, WIP is um, moving into being an example of not following those things. So that, again, one of my conclusions, that undermines the ability to do other geologic repositories. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.